future of archiving looks like. It looks a little bit like uh, a war of attrition uh, with wearable computing, um, which would involve people like me trying to prevent people like Neil from recording me. <laughs> um, for real, it's going to be like that. So, hi everyone, my name is Aaron. Um, I am not a trained museum professional, uh, nor am I uh, a trained computer programmer. I am, if anything, a painter by training. Um, and I am also part of that generation for whom everything changed when the web happened. We all basically dropped everything we were doing and flocked to it, perhaps like lemons, um, but no one has ever stopped being in love with it. Uh, that's part of the reason why I'm in this business now. I think it's important to preserve it. Um, this really happened. Computer vision is going to make archiving lots of fun. Uh, I'm going to start with a quote by Umberto Eco from a piece he wrote shortly after the WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks cables were released. Uh, don't worry, this is not a talk about WikiLeaks, uh, but hold on to these words and treat them as a kind of soundtrack music uh, for the rest of this presentation. I once had occasion to observe that technology now advances crime-wise. A century after the wireless telegraph revolutionized communications, the internet has reestablished the telegraph that runs on telephone wires. Analog video cassettes enabled film buffs to peruse a movie frame by frame by fast forwarding and rewinding to lay bare all the secrets of the editing process. But digital CDs now allow us to quantum leap from one chapter to another. High speed trains take us from Rome to Milan in three hours, but flying there, if you include transfers to and from the airports, it takes three and a half hours. So it wouldn't be extraordinary if politics and communication technologies were to revert back to the horse drawn carriage. So hello again, my name is Aaron. Uh, these days I'm head of internet typing at the uh, Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. As was mentioned, we're part of the Smithsonian. Uh, we're up in New York. For those of you who don't know, uh, super short history is we began life as a private decorative arts museum. In the late 60s we became part of the Smithsonian. In the mid 90s we made the decision to become, to take on the mantle of a national design museum trying to figure out what that means ever since. Uh, and digital has made that even more complicated. Um, we're closed right now uh, for renovations, and everything's on the table. Uh, we are trying to figure out what it means to make the museum part and parcel of the internet, and vice versa. Um, and that goes all the way down to collecting. We, the design museum, increasingly has to figure out what it means to collect intangible objects. What does it mean for us to collect service design or experience design? Um, with that said, I'm going to talk around the work that we're doing and not about the specifics. Um, I want to talk about the sort of continuous partial event horizon that we're all living through these days uh, to, to, to try and give some context to the work we're doing, to try and understand what the medium and long term uh, looks like for a museum. You can't really read the text, but this is my new favorite Twitter account. Someone created it just after uh, Boston Dynamics and DARPA released a 300 pound bipedal robot last week called Atlas. So someone created the DARPA Atlas robot Twitter account and it just wanders around asking questions like, is that a license plate? Is that a big society? <laughs> is that skeuomorphic? Um, this thing is supposed to be for humanitarian and disaster relief purposes. <laughs> it's hard to believe that, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, and, and what I like about this is when you think about, and we've all been talking about uh, how, how amazing disk, disk storage is, right? Like, I like to imagine that this comes equipped with all of human knowledge, or maybe even just the Internet Archive, and it wanders the earth, stopping at campfires, telling people stories. <laughs> um, <laughs> and if we start to imagine that robots like these are people, 
or people enough, what do they see? Okay, even if we understand that they're not actually seeing anything, when do we care enough about the history of their observations that we forgive them their lack of awareness? Much the same way that a design museum will forgive an object its lack of functionality and still collect it anyways. This is my still favorite uh, Twitter account, not simply because uh, the Cooper Hewitt has a Roomba in its collection, um, but because this Twitter account is what it means to be a museum in 2013. And it's not about Twitter. It's absolutely not about Twitter. Twitter is the delivery mechanism. What you're seeing here is someone who's gone to the trouble to create a record of history about an object that will probably outpace and outclass anything we ever do. People are doing this on their own. And we need to get used to the idea that people are breathing life into our objects. And sometimes it's not even people. I like to joke that when when we look about we talk about sensors a lot, and no one thinks about the so about elevator songs as having any meaning. But we ascribe a lot of meaning to whale songs, and we have no idea what they're saying. Um, and so when I talk about these, I talk about it as people creating a communal proof around things. And that's a really big deal for us. Thirsty. Um, I talk about communal proofs a lot at the museum. We have about 270,000 objects in our collection. 120,000 of them are publicly viewable. Of those, one-fifth have uh, imagery. And for the whole set, uh, probably the majority has metadata that could best be classified as poor. And that's OK. That's the history. We got this far on the back of all that terrible data. It can only get better. The reason I talk about communal proofs at the museum is to say that the work we're doing is we're standing these objects up in public as even though they're incomplete, despite their being incomplete, because they are being incomplete. Because what that does is it starts to lend weight and gravity to these things. It means that the URLs, which are a proxy, it's not a replacement, but they start to have weight and mass, and it gives people confidence to allow other things to orbit them. And that's a really, really big deal for us. Because honestly, we have things that haven't been digitized. We don't know who did it. We don't know what it's called. Basically, all we know is that it's a piece of paper. These are purely intellectual, conceptual devices at this point. And by at least giving them a link, it gives something that two people can share together. Um, and so the ability to create with uh, and participate in communal proofs, uh, I think, is one of the reasons that we saw the rise of social media. Social media is just buzzword, buzzword bingo for something that has been happening forever. It's a deep vein that essentially what happened was the technology finally reached a point where it could burst through. And suddenly you saw people participating. You saw people doing stuff together. You saw people leaving traces. More than anything, you were leaving traces saying, I was here in this world. It happened. So for the last couple of years, I've been working on a side project called Parallel Flickr, which is basically just a, a tool to archive my photos on Flickr. Um, I want to point out that when I talk about Flickr or Parallel Flickr, Think of them as reference implementations or proofs of concept. You could replace them with Twitter, Facebook, anything of that scale with that many people, and all the same issues apply. Um, I focus on Flickr because I'm scarred by it. <laughs> um, I'm not going to get into the technical details of the software. I'm going to just talk about a couple of things that I've been trying to poke at while I've been working on it. One of them is, what is the representative sample of something as big as Flickr? something whose edges you can't even see. Um, I don't think there is a representative sample. Uh, personal archiving in general, and um, Ann Wooten mentioned it yesterday, what is the responsibility of an individual to back up their own damn stuff? I mean, there is something to be said about that. Um, and finally, trying to create a living, breathing archive, a tool that actually works, that isn't just a bag of files. I have created those bags of files, and I thought, 
What would I do if I had to bring those up tomorrow? I would put them on the web and it would be a directory listing. And that would suck. Um, I realize not everyone agrees with me on this, but we are fast approaching the time when the expectation for most people is that preservation and access and more, just as importantly, functionality are all the same thing. Or rather, you can't have one without the other two. Just consider the way that, uh, to Brewster Kale's never-ending consternation, people continually confuse the Wayback Machine with the Internet Archive. They don't see any difference. Think about the way the stunned disbelief that people have when they find out that the Library of Congress has all of Twitter, but you can't see it. Um, but there's a fourth thing, and this is the really important one, uh, which is the interactions that a site like Flickr exposes, which is really fancy talk for relationships, uh, which is slightly less fancy talk for permissions. Right? Like, understand that all of these sites succeeded uh, because they encouraged people to share things, to do things in the open, to be willing to participate with people, but they did not mandate it. And I've joked to people that the, pretty much the only way that you can archive Flickr is to buy it, because that's the only way you can meaningfully preserve the permission model. Or you have to act like Facebook. So, one of the things that Parallel Flickr tries to do from a technical level is it uses the, the Flickr API uh, to log people into the site. Basically like Facebook Connect, but for Flickr. One of the things you get by using the API is I can then pull down the list of my contacts, the relationships that I have with people on Flickr. And so that means that if you come and you're logged out, you only see public photos. But the minute you log in, the site now knows who you are, and it knows who you are in relationship to me, which it knows, it means it knows how to start to show you private and semi-private photos. This is not a perfect solution by any stretch, um, but I'm not sure anyone else has done anything like this, and it's a start. And it's certainly better than, than my having to simply wipe all those private photos from the face of the earth, because I'm not going to just make them public. Um, and the reason I mention this is that as I've been doing all of this, I've been increasingly bumping up against the idea that uh, maybe the future of archiving and preservation is going to involve a lot more running of services than we're used to thinking about. For example, what would it mean for the Library of Congress to run an instance of Parallel Flickr, or something like it, again, reference implementation? What would it mean for the library not simply to archive its own photos, which I grant you is a bit of a circular argument since they came from the library, but to go one degree of separation out and to get in touch with all the people who've ever interacted with those photos, left a comment, favorited it, whatever, and to say to them, to offer, to let them to opt in to archive their photos and their favorites. What if you did that two degrees out? What that means is you have a subset of something that's a biggest flicker. But what you really have is you have the meaningful interaction, the intersection of all those people who did something with the Library of Congress's photos. Now the important part of this is that the Library of Congress pledges to preserve the permissioning model. It pledges, it says, as long as we can say in confidence that we know who you are on Flickr, we will do the permissioning trick. But the moment that we're not confident, anything that isn't explicitly public will go dark, and the so-called seven-year rule, the seven-year clock will kick in. Whether it's 70 years, 100 years, that's implementation detail. But what that means is that at the end of those 70 years, those photos revert back. Those photos are put into the public domain. And so there's a very real contract going on where the Library of Congress pledges to preserve the present, and individuals pledge to gift that present to the future. Um, and because Parallel Flickr goes out of its way to preserve both the ID and the URL structure, it means that two separate institutions can start to tackle different pieces of the puzzle, independent of one another, and then merge those results back together as a way to try and figure out how to regrow organically a network that 
it's as big as Flickr. But then this happened. Does anyone recognize this? So sometime in 2008, the then and current head of the National Security Agency asked, reasonably enough, why don't we just collect all the signals? And so now, we have the Utah Data Center, which is located just across the field from the Thanksgiving Point Butterfly Garden and Golf Club. I did not know that until the other day. Uh, in Bluffdale, Utah. And this is, uh, we're told, where all the signals will live. <laughs> so this raises a sort of uncomfortable issue for people in the cultural heritage world. Um, we are starting to share more in common with agencies like the NSA than anyone knows quite how to conceptualize. Um, Bluffdale, it is claimed, will not simply preserve and archive all of the internet tapped at the source. It might just be fun, but again, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. But it will provide the facilities to index, query, and replay the damn thing, right? We just replay the internet. Which sounds a lot like the kinds of missions and mandates that we claim as so-called memory institutions, just without the buffer of time, right? Once the sort of information that's being collected at places uh, like Bluffdale is divorced from any immediate consequence, it will, I bet, be heralded as a rich trove of capital H history. Which begs one question, is Bluffdale the new national law? Um, it also raises another slightly uncomfortable question. Uh, how do we archive this? Or if we choose not to archive it because it's a kind of archive, do we just throw in the towel and let the NSA do it? Um, maybe. So how did we get here? I'm gonna have to go quickly because I have three minutes. I'm not gonna get there, but anyways. Um, there's, I think we're trying to figure out, still trying to figure out how we got here, but there's a couple of likely suspects. Um, one of them is that uh, consumer grade technology has simply leapfrogged our ability to raise funds and hire third party contractors. Uh, I know that's not pleasant to hear, but it's true. Um, I don't wanna belittle the technical chops uh, that an organization like the NSA has, but it's not like they built a jetpack. Right? Like, it, this isn't technological magic. What's different here is that they were given the freedom to think that big. Um, and the other suspect is something called unitary executive theory, which is another gift from the 1980s, that decade that just keeps on giving. Um, unitary executive theory is part of the long-running debate about the separation of powers between the executive and legislative branches. Um, it's a position that basically says, legislature, sure, but the executive can do whatever it wants. Really, that's about what it says. Um, it was a position that was advanced by the Justice, Justice Department uh, during the Reagan administration. Uh, and despite being largely trounced by the Supreme Court at the end of the 80s, uh, many of those same lawyers found themselves working in the office of the legal counsel for the second Bush administration in a post-September 11th world. Uh, the OLC writes briefs for the president basically outlining what they think is or isn't legal. Um, and they more or less said to President Bush, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> Around the same time, if there's anyone here from the National Archives, I'm really sorry. Uh, around the same time, the laws regulating the number of years uh, before which presidential papers had to be released went from 12 years to seven years. Now, I'm not just trying to pick on uh, the last administration here. I mean, there, there is a point to this. Um, the stated reason for this change was to better foster an environment where the president's advisors could feel confident giving quote unquote honest counsel uh, without those recommendations blowing back on them later in their professional lives. Uh, you know what? Uh, we can bigger over the number of years, but that's not a crazy position. Um, Dick Cheney, when he was vice president, is famously said to have issued using email at all, so he would leave no written record. 
Remember uh, Echo's horse-drawn carriage? Uh, Dana Boyd is a researcher at Microsoft, and she's best known for her work with uh, youth culture and internet, uh, the internet, and has written that privacy is a feeling that people have when they feel as though they have two important things. One, control over their social situation, and two, enough agency to assert control. Now, that's kind of the crux of this. She goes on to say, one of the reasons that I love working with teenagers is because even though they have very limited agency, limited agency, they still desperately crave it and try to find it in the cracks and folds of their lives. What this means is that they don't take control for granted. They assume that they have limited control over social situations because they're constantly having control taken away from them, most notably from their parents. Surveillance is a given in their word, world, something that more teens take for granted than not. They're not thinking about corporations or government, but parents and teachers and friends. They're worried about social privacy, not data privacy, because violations of social privacy are very real to them. In Europe, there are serious laws on the books to ensure that people have a right to know what sort of data is being collected about them, at least by the private sector. But they don't have the right to be forgotten by those companies. That was a decision that just came down a couple weeks ago. So they lack agency to insert control. So that's the sort of common theme running through all of this. When you think about social websites, understand that the ability for people to control who sees the kinds of things that are there is really important. When you see the government basically just saying, we're not going to, we don't know, it's the same phenomenon. Um, I used to joke that Facebook has become the world's largest honeypot, um, at least before the US government decided to nationalize the internet. Um, According to Wikipedia, a honeypot is a computer, data, or network site that appears to be part of a network, but is actually isolated and monitored, and which seems to contain information or a resource of value to attackers. Okay, I realize it's the end of the day. It sounds a little dire. I don't need to be the bad trip for everyone. Um, because let's be clear about something. Long removed from the pain of the now, and it may take one or two or ten generations, our future selves will thank the NSA or Facebook if we can ever figure out how to get that stuff out for all the stuff they've been collecting. And in a way, if you sort of cross your eyes and look sideways, the NSA are betting on the future in a fairly profoundly optimistic way. And if you hold a particularly tree hoverish and woolly-eyed worldview, as I do, that we are trying to find ways to give voice to the oppressed or the simply ignored, and to write a history whose tapestry is richer than simply the voices of the victors, then the internet and the technology that we've built around it to support it have done a better job furthering that ideal than anything else to date. And historically, we have equated the cost of inclusion with notability. Getting, put, getting your name put in a book actually meant something in a world where books had to be produced and moved around and stored and all the rest of it. And that just doesn't hold anymore. Now, electricity is the weak link in this argument, but I think that might be an event horizon that's permanently lost. If the power goes out, we're going to have much bigger problems on our hands. Um, so maybe we can look at the so-called frictionless nature of communication. Everyone sort of gets all bent out of shape about that. And not see a tragedy of the commons, but see an opportunity to act and serve as a kind of zone of safekeeping. That's what we do as cultural heritage institutions. To bet on the future, much the way the NSA does, uh, but actively and deliberately working to temper the creepy bits. Because it's creepy. I mean, and so maybe this is the challenge going forward. To debate and advance a rhetoric and a measure against which we might be judged and challenged that aims not to deny the future, but simply to figure out what it means and how to protect the present from itself. Um, 
we are and have been for a while been living in one of those between two bus stop moments, and I'm not sure it's going to change anytime soon. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to all the problems that I've just laid on the table. Um, this is the work, uh, and I think if nothing else, we should just acknowledge that the problem is real and figure out uh, what to do. So, thank you.